This is the new Lexus ES, and it's a bit like a Liger, which is a cross between a lion and a tiger, a Zebroid, which is a cross between a zebra and a horse, or a Karma, which is a cross between a camel and a llama. They're all hybrids, and so is this car. In fact, it's a hybrid alternative to the German posh saloon cars. Ideal if you want something that looks a little bit different and you don't fancy diesel power. I really like the look of this car. I think it's very distinctive. It certainly stands out next to the more conservative Germans. You've got this really big, strange looking grille. There's lots of folds and creases. I mean, it's a cliche to say, but it's like metal origami. All cars get a little spoiler at the back and very shapely lights with these arrows in them as well. The range topping car actually has sequential indicators, just like an Audi, and three LED bulbs rather than the standard one. Very nice car on the outside. It's also very interesting design on the inside as well. Generally, quality is exceptional, so very soft touch materials here on the dash. And up here, you've got leatherette that's been stitched, and that is actually hand stitched by humans. The machine hasn't done it. The Japanese have done that by hand. Then there's various metal accents about the place, and they're apparently called Hadori, which is something to do with Japanese swords. Yeah! But then there's a few bits and pieces which just let the side down and they're just unnecessary, like scratchy as heck here. Down here by the door, it's a bit scratchy. But the worst bit is up here on the dash, that's really thin and scratchy. In fact, I've just marked it. And here it's awful. It's like out of some really, really cheap entry-level Toyota. Now, there's some other bits and pieces which are a bit odd as well in the layout. You have your control here for the infotainment system, but then you have some other controls for the infotainment system up there. You have your controls for like the heated seat and stuff down here, but then the ventilation controls are up here. Then you have some controls here for your camera and your heads-up display, and then the parking brakes just down here for some reason. Right. Now, when you turn the car on, look, it moves your seat forward and your steering wheel into position. So moves it back when you get out so it's easy to get in and out. As you turn on the car you get the digital display light up and it's really clear, it's mainly digital, you've just got a couple of analogue dials towards the right, very easy to understand what's going on with that and you can control the different menus and flick through them using the control on the steering wheel. Another thing I like is this, so the different driving mode buttons are up here so you can get to them easy off the steering wheel rather than being down here like there are in many other cars. That is all good. What's bad is the infotainment system itself. Infotainment systems are supposed to be there to help you, whereas this one seems like a psychometric test. It's that confusing the way the menus are laid out. Then when you combine that with the hand-eye coordination required to operate this mouse feature to actually hit different icons, do you know what? I reckon the RAF could use this system to evaluate whether a candidate is suitable to fly fast jets. It's that tricky. In fact, why don't we talk about this car's specs. You get a reversing camera and front and rear, there they are, parking sensors, a sunroof and heated front seats. And it's a high-tech cruise control system which will use radar to keep you a safe distance from the car in front. It will automatically steer the car to keep you in lane and it'll even work in stop-start traffic. And you get that as standard on all models, which is really rare. F Sport models add sportier seats, adaptive suspension, and aluminium sports pedals. Top of the range Takumi models get a rear sun blind. You also get soft anline leather. The rear seats are electrically reclining. The front seats have 10 weight electrical adjustment and heating and cooling. A huge 12 inch infotainment system rather than the usual eight inch one. 17 speaker Mark Levinson stereo, which sounds absolutely brilliant. You also get some expensive looking blackwood trim inlays and you even get a heads-up display finally let's talk about practicality here in the front so i like the fact that you can move the steering wheel on this particular car electrically and there is enough adjustment in it and yeah the seats oh my gosh the seats are super comfortable there's not too much headroom though so you might struggle if you're really tall here in the front can you see look not loads in terms of storage spaces, they're okay. So the door bin's a bit on the small side, but you can just about squeeze a litre bottle in there. There's a little cubby area down here for some coins, I guess. Down here you have a cup holder, but you might be thinking that's gonna get in the way of the gear selector when you put a bottle in there. But look, it's so deep that actually it doesn't at all. You're then thinking though, wait a minute, if I put a coffee cup in there, surely it's, um, yeah, it's a little bit too deep, but you can actually press a button and it pops up so even a small coffee cup, you can fit it in there and it doesn't go too deep. 
Also, anyway, you've got another storage area here where you could put another cup of coffee if you wanted to for your passenger. And there's a little place for your mobile phone as well. And next to it, you have your charging ports there. You have two USBs if you want. Underneath this armrest, there's plenty of room and there's also a charging pad on this particular car for a mobile phone. What if your passenger wants to get into this? No problem, it opens that way too. How clever is that? Finally, the glove box. It's not the biggest, but it goes back a long way, so plenty of space, really. And I like the fact that even here, mm, soft padded material on the outside feels luscious. Right, let's go into the back. So, one thing about this car is that it is fairly long. So look at this, I have a decent amount of leg room. I mean, absolutely loads of leg room, really good. You can stretch out. I also like the fact that the seat bases are nice and deep, so you get lots of under thigh support. The problem though is this. So that sloping roof line means that if you're really tall, you're gonna hit your head on the roof. It's gonna feel cramped for people over six foot here in the back, no head room really at all, which is a shame. If you wanna carry three at once, then it gets even worse. So the middle seat is a bit raised up, so then, yeah, no good for me at all. And because this roof line slopes in and you have the grab handle there, if you have three in the back, they end up whacking their heads off that. It's not great for three in the back, especially when you compare it to something like an Audi A6. Under here, you've got an armrest and look at this, you've got some storage in there. And look, some pop-out cup holders and a little through loading hatch for your skis, maybe, if you fancy going skiing. Other things to note, oh, look at this. This feels expensive. You have airplane style folders on the front seat backs, which means that when you put your iPad in there, it doesn't flop about, it's all very secure. And you can charge it there and two other mobile devices as well, because you've got 12 volt there and two USB charging ports there. The door bins in the back are pretty good as well. Oh, if I'm gonna get it out, look, a litre bottle, it does fit. Onto the boot. So in terms of the size, the boot capacity is 454 litres, which may sound all right, but it's actually quite a bit less than you get with this car's German alternatives. For instance, a Mercedes E-Class Saloon's boot is around 18 of these larger. Quite a big difference. Thankfully though, the boot is actually quite deep, so you can load it up quite high, so you can actually fit a decent amount into it. I mean, obviously you'll be able to fit a baby buggy as well, and some golf clubs, no problem at all. There is a bit of lip to lift stuff over. It's not the worst car, and the opening isn't the widest in the world, but it's livable. You can live with this, look. In terms of features in the boot, there aren't that many. You have some hooks there you can hang your shopping off. There's some tethering points there, some more there. And if you lift this up, which it invites you to do, look, lift, like that, and hook. That's because you can just hook it up on the top of the boot. There's a little bit of storage under there and you've got your tyre repair kit. Mm. Probably the biggest problem though with this car's boot is that you can't fold down the rear seat. So if you want to carry really long items, you better get another car. And that brings me on to five annoying things about the Lexus ES. This is a supposedly high-tech car, yet when you want to open the sunroof blind, you've got to do it the old-fashioned way, manually. Ah, I think I've just pulled the muscle in my shoulder. While the graphics for the 360-degree bird's view camera is pretty good, the actual reversing camera one is terrible. I mean, it looks like something from a Nintendo 64 game. Racy export models play fake engine sounds with the car speakers, so it sounds a little bit more exciting than this normal version, which makes this noise when you rev it. Yeah, that's hardly gonna get petrol heads excited now, is it? Don't ever touch this metal strip here on the dash, because if you do, look, it just picks up finger marks, something rotten, look at that. This soft effect light, the interior looks kind of cool, but it just isn't bright enough. In fact, even when you've got the extra two LEDs on, it's all a little bit dim when it's dark at night. Thankfully, this car has plenty of cool features to help make up for all this. Here's five. The auto emergency braking with pedestrian detection can work at night, and it will also work in reverse, and has been specifically designed to look out for small children. Normally when you lift off the accelerator in a hybrid, they slow down quite suddenly as they try to recharge at their batteries. But this one doesn't, it just coasts like a normal conventional car. That's because it's fitted with something called active glide control. Look, it even says so there, so you can just roll along. If you want on this particular car, I can move the front passenger seat here from the back. So if I'm behind it, I can really stretch out if I want to. 
The alloy wheels have a hollow ring in them to help reduce tire noise. There's three layers of insulation between the engine bay and the passenger compartment to stop the sound of the electric components bothering you. And then 93% of the car's floor is cladded with soundproofing. And all of this is designed to make the car as peaceful as possible to travel in. I love just how smooth and quiet the electric windows are. Oh. Oof, that just oozes quality. Now let's hit the road to see how the ES copes in town. One thing I really like about driving this Lexus ES is that the dash seems nice and low, so you can actually see the end of the bonnet, which gives you lots of confidence when you're driving around town. It's also fairly decent over speed humps, soaks them up okay. When you're driving along, it seems comfortable enough, but then if you come to a really bad road, the car does just shimmy maybe a little bit, like that. Look, <laughs> is it rocking? And if you hit a sudden bump or pothole, a real sharp one, then all of a sudden there's a jolt. It's almost like it has a sleep twitch and it suddenly wakes up and goes, oh gosh, what was that? It's just not quite so comfy over bumps as a Mercedes E-Class. One thing this Lexus 300h has in its favor though is that being a hybrid, you can mooch around at slow speeds using electric power alone. So it's just really quiet and relaxing. But when you put your foot down, the petrol engine does kick in to give you a turn of speed. Then there's the brakes. So now they can feel a little bit jerky. So you press them, not a lot happens. And you press them a bit more, and they suddenly like pile on the car, brakes suddenly. I think part of that is to do with the fact that you've got regenerative braking. So as you slow, the brakes recoup lost energy and put them into the battery. So they just don't feel that natural. Now, when it comes to parking, the fact we've got this reversing camera really does help. The steering's nice and light as well. Visibility is all right too. I like the fact that the door mirror does drop down slightly so you can see the curb. So hopefully I shouldn't curb the wheels. It's actually quite an easy car to park. And there we go, no problem at all. Now, because this is quite a long car, it does affect its maneuverability. So let's say you need to go all the way around a mini roundabout. Oh, you might find it a little bit tricky. You do have to take a wide berth, but you can just about do it. Whew. It's tight. One thing I love about this Lexus is its seats. They are probably the most comfortable out of any car I've driven recently. However, what spoils the ambience is that you just get a little bit more wind noise when you're traveling at motorway speeds. The worst thing though is when you suddenly need to overtake. So I'm doing 60 miles an hour now. I'm gonna floor it. There's 70, but did you hear that? That kind of the engine kind of complains a bit like a teenager when it's being told to go and do the washing up. It's like, why? Don't want to. Another thing the S doesn't like is being pushed particularly hard on a twisty road because it just feels a little bit cumbersome and lumpen. So then, my verdict on this car, should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should consider the Lexus ES. It is an interesting car and it gives great economy without being a diesel. Problem is though, in almost every area, it is bettered by the Germans.